and it's my pleasure to welcome you to help us celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Stewart Collection and the publication of Landmarks, a book about the first 15 works. There are going to be more. Um, I'm Mary Beebe, director of the collection. As a part of this amazing moment in time, we asked all the artists, plus our advisory committee and our book team, if they would join us for discussions and parties. The Office of the Chancellor and the Helen Edison Lecture Series agreed to help. We thank them for their support, and we are thrilled to have so many of you here. The events of the last few months have meant that not all the artists and teams could be here. We're sad about that, as are they, but we know that they're here in spirit. And we're deeply honored that so many of the Stewart Collection artists are here. It's a stellar group, and we are going to have fun. Our first moderator today is Hugh Davies, director of the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. Thank you, Mary. Welcome to the lounge. We are all together. Having this uh, congregation of great artists is something akin, as Mary and I have been explaining to people um, at the university, to having a, a group of Nobel Prize winners together. And that, that is, uh, and also is like <laughs> having a group of all-stars. I didn't mean to demean you in that limiting way. These are people who think more expansively. But um, the Stewart Collection is, is a haven that really distinguishes this campus from uh, uh, its otherwise undistinguished architecture. I think I can say that as an <laughs> outside person. But the, uh, the Stewart Collection is more than decor to save the buildings. It really is bringing art to the heart of the matter. And our colleague Rob Storr uh, from the Museum of Modern Art, who unfortunately couldn't be here, has written a terrific essay for this great publication, Landmarks, which we are also celebrating today, which I encourage you to acquire at the uh, bookstore here on campus. I gave it the plug, Mary. That was... But, um, yeah, or at the museum. And uh, in discussing, actually, Michael Asher's work, this wonderful drinking fountain, which is so provocative, Rob Store talks about the fact that uh, uh, Michael Asher's medium is not so much the materials at hand, but the ideas that he's juggling. And the primary idea is, uh, what is art? And trying to hone in on, on thinking about art. Chief among them are the unexamined ideas about art that nearly everybody starts with, and too many otherwise sophisticated people hold on to as if their life depended on them, when to the contrary, intellectual growth and artistic pleasure depend on getting rid of just such received opinion. Universities, oddly enough, and this is not UCSD, have frequently shown themselves the last bastions of such conservatism. Paradoxically, places devoted to thinking about the sciences, social sciences, philosophy, history, and the other weighty disciplines tend to spin off hostile towards art, like organisms genetically susceptible to a particular virus that selectively attacks aesthetic sensibilities and aesthetic speculation. Alternatively, universities may smother the artistic imagination by treating its products as mere epiphenomena of truly important scientific, social scientific, philosophical, or historical developments. In short, as if they were illustrations of big ideas best understood by specialists in other fields, rather than big ideas best approached on their own terms. And uh, for me, what distinguishes the Stewart Collection is the fact that the university has embraced artists as people who create big ideas that need to be welcomed into the academy rather than kept at arm's length. And of course, we're enormously grateful, as, as Mary mentioned, to those at the university who have made this possible. But what I think we celebrate today is the uh, accomplishment of Jim De Silva, who is an extraordinary patron in uh, bringing the, the resources, but also being able to step back and, and trust Mary and trust the artist to achieve their, their best work. So our hat is off to Jim De Silva, friend of both sculptors and students. And then Mary has had the courage to say no to some very great artists who have not done their best work and have not brought their, their big idea to the table. And then this trio is completed by Matthew Gregoire, who is the bricoleur extraordinaire, who has this enormous pride in, in realizing these, these artworks and, and ensuring that they're done correctly. So we've had discussions over the years about how can you take what, it, what has been achieved at the Stewart Collection as a model for, um, for public art. And I would uh, kind of jump into the conversation at the outset by saying you really can't. It's about three extraordinary people who devoted their efforts to creating a climate where artists could flourish. So uh, don't try and can this and take it to uh, Cleveland or Miami or somewhere else. But of course the, uh, the, the core of the matter are the artists. So 
I turn to the artists now to, to have this conversation, this discussion, where I hope I can uh, gracefully move out of the way. But as Bob Irwin was saying to me yesterday, there was a recording at Carnegie Hall, the first jazz recording that, that ever took place. And uh, the, the jazz musicians were intimidated by the context. This won't happen with these guys and gals, believe me. <laughs> not a problem. But uh, apparently it was very flat. They didn't get going. And then Gene Krupa, who was a drummer, started thrashing his drums and flailing away and just basically uh, flogged the rest of these musicians into uh, achieving what they could do. So I won't have to play that role, luckily, and I'm delighted not to have to. Oh, I'm sure I won't. But I would start out actually by asking uh, you, Jackie, since you have probably as much or more experience than uh, any of the artists uh, uh, here today at working in the public arena, how working at the Stewart Collection is similar to other uh, public art situations and how it differs. And then I'll sort of move down and ask each of you uh, other questions and hope to let you take it from there. So Jackie, if you would. Well, it started out so exotic because I had never been to the West Coast. So, and I had to meet Mary in Los Angeles. And then we went to meet with Charles Moore and um, John Rubel and Buzz Udell, who are his partners in the office there. And they were the designers of the building that I was going to hopefully do something for. And we went to dinner with Charles. And it all seemed wonderful. And everybody was so lovely. And they couldn't have been nicer. And the next day, we drove to here, and I met with the scientists. It was, from, from the very initial, it was really just a wonderful, lovely, lovely, wonderful experience. And one of the really special things about it is that I mean, the only sense I, I try to do, I try to not be confrontational with, with what the uh, client might want, you know, if they want dry, I really would not make a big pool in the middle of something. And the only sense I could get from the scientists about, and I did meet with them, about what they might want was that they were being a little cagey and kind of secretive. Like they really didn't want people to notice what, whatever it was I did because they were in the midst of being a little bit uh, harassed by students because of these these dreadful experiences. I think it's funny that, that that's like the only little snippet I have is, is me saying that the scientists are doing these dreadful experiments. I knew, I knew they were working with animals and that there was objections to that. And so what I, my sense was that what they would like best of all is that even if I had this big terrace, that nobody you know, could get to it. And it <laughs> In the beginning, although I knew ultimately it would be closed in, I was only going to have the building on one side, and actually people would be able to see the other side, but eventually that would get walled off. And so um, I, I thought of it as a stone garden and, and tried to just do something that I thought would um, be, be interesting for the, for the scientists, and I really don't know if they think it's interesting or not. John, you, you're in some ways, ironically, the rookie in terms of uh, the most recent work completed here. But I wanted to ask you how, um, how making the shift from working in a, in a studio way, in, in galleries and in museums, to working in a, in a truly public place, the library's not open 724, but pretty much. It's a very different audience. It's not as controlled. It hasn't pre-selected itself to have an art experience. How did that affect your thinking in uh, making this wonderful piece? Well. Um, it's true. I had not, uh, or I had done a very little public art uh, prior to this, and certainly not of this uh, magnitude. And when when Mary had asked me, I I, I sort of laughed it off, and then I said, "Mary, I'm, you know, I'm not a sculptor," and that didn't seem to dissuade her. Uh, and uh, I had known her previously from the Portland Center for the Visual Arts, and. Uh, where they were putting on these credible exhibitions of art in the, through the 70s. Uh, and uh, she made, I had done an exhibition there and she made it so easy. Uh, uh, so I, I didn't you know, turn my hearing off and, I, and, and she, she kept at me and never gave up and, and, and eventually uh, uh, I said yes. I mean, the whole idea that she didn't prejudge and saying, "Well, only sculptors can, you know, can can work here." I think she 
truly did the right thing. And she judged the artist, and and uh, which I think the one so that's something that should always be done, and not you know not the art. Uh, and uh, then slowly, uh, th through a lot of um, arduous sort of uh, sifting, I suppose, uh, arrived at, at this project. Originally, I, I wanted to do a pair of doors on campus that somehow would uh, call to mind the Ghiberti doors in Florence of the life of Christ, and, and except using scenes from the life of Christ, just use uh, low-relief scenes in bronze, uh, popular culture uh, for movies specifically. Uh, and we took a tour around campus, and uh, there were no kind of grand doors around. There were, you know, pretty much the basic six-foot-eight uh, glass doors, and uh, ended up at the Geisel Library. And at that point, the, the project escalated, thinking about working with glass, and then we thought about uh, maybe etching glass doors, and then uh, Matthew, the genius that he is, you know, finding ways to get the imagery on the glass in the, in the right kind of transparency, where it wasn't too opaque nor, you know, too invisible. Working uh, w w with Mary and Matthew and her staff, it has, well, I have to reiterate uh, what uh, Alex said, uh, makes it so easy. And I think, what, actually, Alex probably has well, a pretty long track record on doing contemporary art, and I remember she said something years ago about it. She said it's so discouraging. You have your whole project planned out and almost done, and then the architect comes up to you and says, well, I'm sorry, we're going to have a ventilating duct there, and, you <laughs> and then you just have to rethink it. That never happened. Uh, uh, Mary and Matthew always uh, prioritized uh, the artist and and uh, encouraged you actually to do the things that you really wanted to do and it, I can't think of any uh, more ideal situation and now I'm quite positive about doing public art I must say I really enjoyed it and it came out exactly the way I wanted it you know I if, the, if there's anything wrong I can only be blame myself I can't blame them or anybody <laughs> Thanks, John. Alexis, um, the snake path, how did that grow out of your, your earlier work? I mean, it's very specific in its placement, but it obviously comes out of uh, ideas that were already there. Well, it's sort of my, my first fool's Russian construction, big construction project. Um, I actually had done um, permanent installations and museum installations that were really big but that were painted and had collages and whatever and I did a huge piece for the Brooklyn Museum I think in 1986 or 87 that had a was sort of like a huge 60 something foot wide like orange crate label painting that had was sort of based on the Garden of Eden like a um, that had oranges and had a, a snake that that was a road that came down and became a snake and when I was installing that piece in Brooklyn I had this dream that I really could make a snake that you could walk on. And I, Mary had asked me to do something like, I don't know, that year, and I had not thought of anything. And we had looked at sites, and, and we to I toyed sort of briefly with the idea of doing a plaza or something. And, but it wasn't until I sort of dreamed about the snake that it sort of fell into place because the Actually, they, I knew that the library was going to expand, and there was actually a parking lot where that hillside is then, but they, they were going to dig out all the dirt under the, under the uh, library and put an underground e expansion and then put dirt over the top and make a hillside. So the, not only was the snake and the tree of knowledge and the Garden of Eden and all that sort of like the perfect knowledge kind of metaphor, but it also was going to be like the perfect site. So, um, but we did have a, we did have a, one of those standoffs. I had a standoff with the landscape architects for about a year where they, they said, well, we want your snake to, and this is not the landscape architects I wound up working with, I have to say, these are the ones that were part of the library expansion. But um, they said, well, we want your snake to tail to wrap around our amphitheater that we want to put in. <laughs> 
And I said, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that whole thing was dead for like a year until finally they gave up on the amphitheater and we, we moved forward and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, I think it was, um, it w it's really a special, as John was saying, it's really a special kind of an atmosphere to work here because when you work on big construction projects in the real world and stuff, everybody's all the time like fighting about money and you, you know, like, and then things go wrong and it's like he did it, he did it, he did it, and you have to pay for it. And it's just all like everybody's always trying to find somebody to blame for every like weird thing that happens. And this is an environment for working for artists where it's possible to build some really neat thing that has very complicated, you know, like structurally and physically. And in my case, I think my piece is probably the best piece I've ever done in terms of having the idea and the materials and stuff be so perfectly woven together as to be one thing. So I, I feel really um, positive about this sort of piece. But the environment of working is the kind of environment where it was kind of like a labor of love. I mean, I was working with people who are my really good friends and we were working over a long period of time and it was a relatively, considering how complicated and difficult it was, it was a real kind of painless and pleasurable experience for me, I think, to work on that thing. So, and uh, Mary Beebe and Charles got married in the Garden of Eden of the snake path. I mean, you know what I mean? It's that kind of a, we have that kind of relationship with with um, the Stewart collection that all these people, all these artists are still, you know, friends with Mary and Matthew, and most of us are friends with each other for a long time and stuff. So it's a real kind of a uniquely kind of weirdly family type situation, considering <coughs> it's such a great art thing. So, thank you. I, I agree completely. Bob, you you were. Um, Nikki de saint did the first piece of Sun God, but you were the first artist to bring site specificity to the campus, and you had the pick of the entire place. Why did you pick the site you selected, and how did your thinking evolve in terms of the great piece that resulted, the flying V's? I'd like to reiterate what was just said. It, it reflects my feeling about it also, although it wasn't as much of a family yet at that point. It, was, it hadn't really gotten that far along. You needed a father at that stage and you came Yeah, out. well I was just looking for work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd, I'd been, uh, you know, wanting to do that kind of thing for some time and but nobody was, nobody was asking, you know. So uh, the invitation to me was, you couldn't, you know, I was there in 10 minutes. I showed up immediately the next morning, you know. Uh, and in selecting the site uh, and walking around the campus, it, it, was, it seemed to me very obvious that the really unique uh, element on this campus are the, uh, uh, the, the uh, eucalyptus trees, which apparently were planted a long time ago. I was told the story, I don't know if it's true, that they were planted to be harvested for railroad ties. Only the man planted the wrong uh, eucalyptus, and they were not... Uh, uh, you couldn't use them for that, that purpose. But uh, in terms of all the campuses that I've been on or you walk through, uh, architecture, yes, no, what have you. I was never fond of it as, at that time. But, but the trees are, are a standout. And I had the, the feeling that it wouldn't be very long before, and uh, as with most campuses, it's not very long before that would be squandered. I mean, there's a, 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 a a great need for more space and more buildings and as campuses grow and expand. And it seemed to me that, that um, if I could do something to bring attention to, to that beautiful thing that graced the campus, that, and in some ways stake out some territory that couldn't be uprooted, uh, or at least potentially couldn't be uprooted, uh, that seemed like a nice, uh, a nice place to enter in. And uh, just walking through those trees at different times of day, uh, you know, it, they're beautiful. I mean, they in a way don't need anything from me, but uh, on the other hand, uh, they were, we habituate to those things to the point where sometimes we're not aware of our own richness and riches. And uh, in this particular case, I really like the idea that, that uh, you walk through them every day. 
as uh, you know, as a common part of your uh, uh, your itinerary, what you do each day, and you don't have to go to some idyllic glen or some hidden secret place. Uh, I I'm a little uncomfortable with all that kind of ceremony. I find it very distracting, and I like the fact that you just naturally encounter it, that it happens uh, without having to go to a museum or without having to go to, as they say, some uh, structured uh, situation. The, in terms of the one story with regards to the, how it is to work with the uh, uh, Stewart collection, uh, when I, this was early on in the project, uh, early on I should say in the Stewart collection, and I built, I forget which part, but a part of it, and it wasn't, uh, it didn't cut, it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't have the right scale. And it's the first and only time in my life I was ever, I actually go back and say, it's too small, you know? <laughs> and they said, oh really, you know? <laughs> and so we talked and they let me make it bigger. And that's, I mean, that's amazing. Instead of it shrinking or being, you know, uh, challenged at every step of the way, they let me make it bigger. I mean, they, <laughs> they accepted the fact that I'd screwed up, that I made a mistake, and that, uh, you know, it could be corrected. <laughs> and that, I thought that was, I mean, you can't say anything more than that. That's uh, completely different than any project I've ever been involved in. That, that relationship has remained, I think, throughout the entire uh, development of this thing, a kind of willingness to, to play, you know, to uh, roll the dice. Start jumping in, but uh, Bob, to keep this rolling, um, having watched for 20 years what, uh, has, what pieces have emerged since yours, what are your thoughts about the development of, um, of public art, art on this campus, and uh, what has succeeded you? In the beginning, I want uh, this idea of, of, of wanting to do something in a situation without really knowing what it was until I was there. And so I would, I sort of, sort of said, I'm, you know, I'm available. I'd love to work. And uh, no one asked for a long while. And then finally someone would, someone I've forgotten who was the first one said, well, we're, we're kind of interested. And I said, yeah, terrific. I'll be there tomorrow. And they said, uh, well, but we need to know what you're going to do. And I said, well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I've got to come and look and, and we'll start from scratch. And they said, oh yeah, of course. Uh, but could you give us some idea what it's going to cost? <laughs> and, and you start beginning to, uh, you know, realize uh, the implications of, of just approaching something that way. I mean, what it has to do with all the organizational concepts that we have and how artists are selected and how contracts are written and what have you. But the thing that has happened is, and it was a very interesting venue uh, for me at the beginning, and then it quickly got corrupted. I mean, people started saying, gee, I wonder what Andy Warhol would do. And well, of course, Andy Warhol could do something in almost any situation. He had that kind of flexibility. But it wasn't his intent, and it wasn't critical to why he was doing what he was doing. And, and so in a way, it very quickly got bastardized to the point where there was, there was, you, you, there was no voice left. And that's what's happened to public art. And, uh, I'm, stu I'm stuck with it, but it's now become a kind of potpourri for all kinds of activities, all kinds of ambitions, all thrown liberally into a pot and salted and seasoned and served up as some kind of, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of different ambitions and rationales. And uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, uh, the Stewart Collection at this point still has some clarity to it and it has a, uh, it still is a place you can, you can play the game legitimately. And well, that's. Uh, no. I have a question because I don't know that I consider the Stewart collection totally public art, and I'm I'm actually surprised that that's what you're calling it. What, why would it not be public art? Because it's on a campus, and uh, no, no, it had nothing to do with that. I mean, so much of public art is um, is legislated, and this is is not. Although there was a plea made for it to start happening, which which would I'm sure would change a lot. This is a collection that's been gathered about using artists to do something outside. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean I don't know that. Uh, public art has has all kinds of connotations that have to do with with. I mean if it's not legislated or you know, like there's a client or there's there's. There are restrictions about it, and I don't feel that there's any kind of restriction this with what can happen here. This is illegal public art. That's right. That's what, That's what it is. It's actually more like a, a museum collection or something because it's curated by Mary. So it has one person's personal kind of vision and ability to say, we, 
we you know we've got we've got this kind of a piece here but we, we you know there there are kinds of work that we don't have and artists who we you know she thinks are interesting and you know what I mean I think that it's more in public art you have a situation where you usually have a financial mandate of like a percent of new construction that's going to be spent on art no matter what and you have a committee or advisors or or you know a political process or something like that and and then sometimes you have a a, a process where people have to come up with proposals and you know have all kinds of different ways of, of choosing people but they are not as um, they're not as um, sort of tender and intelligent <laughs> as this <laughs> they're kind of a lot more you know more of a political, financial kind of free for all, and then the artist has to, you know, fight it out with the architects and and the committees and and the local community standards, and you know, whatever's less left standing is the art. So another huge difference is that for for Mary as a curator, the difference between my curating and Mary's is that when I buy a bad painting, I can put it in the vault and it doesn't get seen again or heard about, but. Mary's tracker. John. I would comment on that, that uh, for me, that was really scary. I said, you know, you just can't take this off the wall and hide it. Uh, uh, it's going to be there. And, and, uh, and uh, you really have to think about the public interacting with it. And, and uh, it's not that you can just take it, you know, you can just take it away. And I, I, I think the other thing about whatever we want to call it, public art or whatever, uh, uh, is that it's, it, I guess the best way to say it, it's like it's art out in the world. I, I remember when I was living down this way, I was teaching at a community college, and w we were putting on some great art exhibitions. Actually, they own one of Bruce's pieces. Um, and because um, we had a purchase award. Uh, at any rate, we, we were called to task about something, and I was marched into the president's office. And he said, I don't care what you guys do, but just keep it inside those walls of the art department. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty uh, instructive, that art's okay as long as it's locked up within walls. Uh, if, it's, if it seeps out, then it's, it gets kind of messy. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it gets mixing with life and people that, don't normally go into an art gallery or museum, it, you know, they, God, you might meet it just walking around the corner, you know, that would be terrible. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, I, and I think for that reason, more and more artists now are getting into that, and, and there's also more and more a blurring, as you probably all know, between high and low culture that has come upon us. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes you see art out there, you don't even know it's art. It's, which is kind of nice. <laughs> it's great. Um, I was at the advisory committee meeting yesterday. We were talking about the future of the Stewart Collection and where, where should we go from here. And basically the, the gist of it was, we're doing great. Don't change a thing. Just keep doing what you're doing, Mary, and we'll do very well. But um, Bob, if you were invited to come back and uh, make another piece now, what would your response be to the campus? And, how would you fit in with a collection now as opposed to starting a collection? I, d I don't, I'm not quite sure how I would, do, how I would deal with that question. I would like to address the, uh, what was just going on a moment. Uh, I think that the, uh, there's, first of all, there's two terms that are used as if they're interchangeable, public art and art in public places. Uh, public art implies something very different. I mean, if you just take the two terms and listen to them, they mean, oh, even though they're used as if they're interchangeable. Uh, public art implies that there is some role, direct role or direct responsibility to some kind of public rationale. And uh, uh, the art in public places, as I understand it, is, has a kind of historical trajectory. And what it really, in a sense, is defining, I think he touched, you touched on it a, a moment ago, it's, it's actually an intellectual space uh, that's outside the parameters of the existing idea of how art is understood and where it's found and what have you. And that it's, it's that opportunity, I think, that makes the whole idea interesting. The fact that, that this particular venue uh, is in a, on a campus is, is uh, I think, probably part of why it, it's managed to do what it's done. But I don't think that makes it less public uh, in, the, in the sense of what I'm talking about as an intellectual arena outside of 
the whole concept of museums and art being caged or held within. Um, the history of art, as I understand it up to this point, has come to a point where we understand we have a, we've made our break with the past, we have a, a, a new philosophic ground, we have a new conceptual ground, we have a new visual vocabulary, and it's become time to sort of find out whether it works or not. And so the whole process of what I think artists are doing outside the, the museum space is to really, in fact, test these ideas to see whether or not they actually make sense, whether or not they work, and what kind of results they actually, uh, and so the idea of having the opportunity to do that, um, because the conflict comes in that this history, as I see it, is, 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 is a very a critical one that needs to be articulated. And yet at the same time, the, the, the culture or the, uh, the uh, public as a whole has no investment or no interest in this particularly, nor should they. Uh, this is still, in a sense, in the process of being uh, uh, not only defined or, and uh, maturated, but also it really, as I say, being going through a, a, a testing period. And so there's a natural conflict when you take this uh, new idea and all the implications it has for our society and put them into the society, there's no reason for people to necessarily want to do that. So this has become a kind of a test tube or a laboratory in between the two. And, and when you go out in the public, as, as Alexis said, I mean, suddenly a whole of, a whole of the set of rationales apply, which have absolutely no bearing on what you're, what, what you're thinking about or doing. History of, for, for us uh, artists collectively of uh, having to, to do walk the art that addresses the white box, <laughs> essentially, you're of different dimensions. Uh, and you get outside and there's just, that box is not there. That's really exciting. But one of the things that's different about public art is, and you see it in this collection particularly, is that it's not the art that's different, it's the audience that's different. Because in the muse when you put something in a museum or a gallery, the audience is the people who know that it's there and choose to go see it. And when you put something out in the world, you get everybody. And they didn't exactly necessarily want to see it or choose to see it or know anything about art or know anything about artists. And so you're really getting like a cross section of sort of everybody and you, you know, it's kind of the art really has to speak for itself in that kind of situation because there's no wall text, you know what I'm saying? There's no explanation of what this weird thing is and who put it there and what it means and whatever and the art has to really, you know, it has to, it has to do something. I mean, it's almost a cleaner, the real world is almost a cleaner space than the white box because it's not freighted with all the, you know, the, the, history of the museum space yeah, and what it, art is but and all that kind of stuff. metaphorically, you know, it's kind of like getting evicted from your house and your furniture's out in the lawn. It is. It used to, you know, right. <laughs> it, the furniture looks more, you know, better in the house than it does in the lawn, but, you know, public <laughs> art is sort of like out in the lawn. <laughs> Maybe your furniture does. <laughs> Something was said about, um, when you asked Bob about fitting into the into the collection, I, I don't know that, um, I know I don't think about things like that and I don't imagine that anybody here would think about that and least of all would I think that Bob would want to think about fitting into the collection, <laughs> but if you were to fit into the collection. Now. Now, it's too late for you to fit in that. <laughs> <laughs> we're about to remove your piece, Bob. <laughs> Actually, I would, I would, I mean, it, I, I, I don't think it's something that should be done, but I wouldn't mind taking another shot at it, you know. I, that would be a really ch fun sort of thing to do. Uh, uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of water's gone under the bridge since then. But that's, I don't think that's what the, what the collection, or what the, what needs to happen at this point at all. Uh, there are, uh, we're, there's been a shift in generations since that was done. Uh, that needs to be looked at. Uh, I, I, my feeling was uh, in that meeting yesterday was that, uh, that Jim De Silva. I don't know if any of you read the little uh, introduction he wrote for the book as to why he got involved in, and sponsored the thing in the beginning in his very self-effacing way. Uh, it's a really lovely little statement uh, about 
uh, his interest, his desire, his um, uh, his his excitement about uh, just the idea of being uh, of you know being associated with art. It's a, it's a very lovely little essay. But um, and Mary and um, Matthew. Uh, my question to them was. Uh, you're, it's been going on for 20 years, and you have now an entirely different set of circumstances. You've uh, proved yourself in a lot of ways. You've created a, a real context, I mean, a really interesting situation. And uh, uh, it might be a nice time to ask yourself, what are your desires now? What are your feelings now? What, what would you like you know, to do? Because uh, uh, you may be able to reset the course slightly uh, and take, a, take into account this new set of circumstances. Uh, it just seemed like a good time to, to uh, take stock, as it were. And it wasn't not the committee taking stock, but the three of you take. Because finally, as you said in the beginning, it's really what makes things work are people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you three have done it. And it's, it's your baby. <laughs> I'm interested in the idea that uh, this was a unique experience in some ways for, for all of you. And how has that, uh, and I think you've been talking about this a lot already, but how has that changed the work that has happened subsequently? I know, John, you were telling me that you've now become a, uh, an artist who works in public places and you've got a project going on in Los Angeles that would have been uh, inconceivable prior to doing the Stewart Collection. Is, is that correct or am I? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm now working with an architect that's on a short list for a building in Los Angeles. And it sort of grew out of this experience. Of, uh, uh, and I'm looking at it positively and uh, looking at the architect like a real artist instead of an architect. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope it's reciprocal. <laughs> but it's been fun, you know, and, and here it's... it's, it's with the Stewart Collection, I mean, the library already existed. In, in this case, uh, the building doesn't even exist. Uh, and it, it's starting, it's starting at that level, you know, with a kind of dialogue where art's not just to be plopped down someplace, but it's supposed to be a, a result of uh, brainstorming uh, with, with the architect. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, frustrating, uh, it's maddening. Uh, this guy comes up about three different models a day, uh, and uh, but it's exciting and and and, and it's uh, like a whole new chapter in my life that's uh, opened up and and you know, all of a sudden I'm you know I keep on saying I've got these visits from the muse at three o'clock at night I wish they were more convenient hours uh, uh, and you know I'm just bowled upright you know for a couple of hours just thinking of stuff that, you know, to, to do that I would never think about necessarily for a gallery or museum show. So it's been rewarding. That's the wonderful thing about working in this field is that the possibilities are all over the place. Uh, it can be something that's you know, 80 feet high, can be 300 feet long, it could be a big pit. It's, it's just, um, it's endless what it can be. And I mean, I just, I mean, it's a thrill. I mean, each new project is a potential thrill because it just might be so different from the other. And, and then the fact that you're asked to deal with a space, because that's mostly what happens with me. So there are, I, I find it interesting, the idea of the limitations that might happen. But even, even so, I mean, even if there weren't, it's, um, I think it's thrilling to be involved in, in work like this. It's just truly thrilling. Alexis, do you have? Um, well, I don't know how. I probably did a couple of really huge <coughs> construction projects since I did this project because this probably worked out so well that it made me really bold about about doing stuff, and, and they were anything but thrilling, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I did two huge, and enormous um, terrazzo floors, one for the, a couple for the LA Convention Center and one for the new sports arena at Ohio State. And I became the world's foremost living expert on epoxy terrazzo, I think. <laughs> but, uh, and then I did a really nice piece for, um, that took some of the Stuart Collection Adam and Eve imagery for the, um, for the uh, restaurant at the 
at the Getty with John. So, um, so I did, I probably, this experience probably made me, made me bold. Um, but in terms of the big real world kind of projects where you fight it out with architects and you argue about money and it goes on for years, um, this project kind of spoiled me and ultimately I went back in my studio because I couldn't stand it. Uh, <laughs> So I think the thing that, that I like about doing this kind of work, but I think it also extends to things that you do that are temporary or projects that you come up with even for museums is I like making something where, where it comes to me as an opportunity and it has a place attached to it and that place has some particular kind of qualities and it has some kind of architectural qualities and it also has some qualities about where it is and who's going to see it. And I like making something for a, for a situation. Um, and I think this was sort of the, in a way, this is, the Stuart Collection was sort of my ultimate opportunity for that. But I think of something that's been in my work like always is even then when they were little in temporary installations, they were just, this is just a better, a much better, you know, grander opportunity, but I like that quality, and I think I got that quality from, um, got that idea from Bob, because he was actually one of my teachers, and he was out kind of talking to us about, you know, about turning whatever was at your, whatever opportunity was in front of you into something a long time ago, probably before a lot of other people got that idea. So, um, so I just see it sort of like as an organic process, and, um, um, and I like that aspect of it. I think it's pretty persistent in my work, so. Bob, last word. Last word? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going to do, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few words. Uh, um, a, a number of years ago, I uh, uh, was asked to do a project at the Miami International Airport and uh, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, well, uh, yeah. I actually invited I think half the people in the room uh, to work in it because it was such a large one. But it was really, in a sense, a kind of uh, I took it on as a case study because in the beginning I didn't think there was any chance whatsoever that it would ever happen. And we were originally brought in for a dialogue myself and some other artists who, were, uh, who turned out not to be interested in, in the dialogue. But I found it a really interesting kind of opportunity. I mean, at that point, in my, my feeling was that you, there are a lot of bad public art projects in the world, and you wonder why they all go wrong, and uh, people have touched base on some of the rhymes and reasons of it. But it seemed to me after you've sent up nine rockets and they all crash, you'd want to uh, a, take a moment and find out what went wrong, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, uh, I, I looked, I, I sort of took on the whole idea, and an airport was, was the most interesting uh, venue because of its complexity. Uh, not only its complexity in terms of, of uh, uh, the, the richness of different kinds of activities and different kinds of uses and what have you, but also the whole concept to plan didn't really work. It was interesting that the, that the airport had a planning, I mean, they had to plan the airport continuously. It was an airport that was built in, 1936, there were still at that time, you could walk out on the tarmac to get on the airplane, and yet on the other hand, you had a, a brand new uh, building with a jet uh, jetway and so on and so forth. Um, and the arts people wanted to be involved, and the airport said, absolutely not, you know, and their reason, which was really very good, is that the arts people, um, the airport felt that it had, on a scale of, of 100, the airport made decisions at, say, 70 miles an hour. And uh, the arts people made decisions at about 10 miles an hour, the, the art committee. So by the time the art people could get their act together, the boat had already sailed. Uh, but the art, but in, in looking at it for a while, the, the, uh, the uh, planners at the airport um, were making plans at 90 miles an hour. And the 20 miles excess was, in a sense, an excuse for bad judgment or bad decisions. They'd say, oh, well. It was just too complex and too difficult. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't get it, you know, we couldn't get it together that way. So it was a way of, of erasing quality as such, or as, as an element within what they did. But the most interesting thing about it is the whole concept of plan. 
uh, was uh, up for gas. By the time they really planned something, uh, that part of the industry went out of business. So the air airlines uh, no longer, like Eastern Airlines, just disappeared in the, right in the middle of it, in the middle of building an entire concourse for Eastern Airlines. And so it, was a, it, it really challenged the whole idea of how you even go about approaching this, the, this kind of, a, of an activity. As uh, everyone has talked about here, that is the place where we all run aground in a way. I think everyone here is capable of doing the kind of incredible things that they've done and can and have done here, but uh, what's really at stake here is the whole concept of plan, how we actually integrate quality into our lives. What happens is that five people get together and, in a, and we'll, let's just assume for a second they're really well-meaning and they intend to do something really great. <laughs> one's responsible for the politics of it, one's responsible for the economics of it, one's responsible, say, for the expertise of airport and so on, et cetera. And, but all of them have the feeling that because they're going to do their work good uh, and they're going to really do a good job, that quality is something that can be appendage to it. There's nobody there at the table to argue that quality is a critical element in the overall understanding and the overall uh, uh, how we, how we uh, experience this situation. Uh, and so each of these people is making decisions on a quantitative basis and they're all doing it as well as they can do it, but finally they think that somehow 1%, which is the worst kind of tokenism, is going to, in a sense, bring quality to this thing. It, I really would argue that, that what all the people here are in some way are leading to is that we're in, the, we're in the quality business, not the quantitative business. And what we're running aground of is all these old methodologies which really don't allow in all those things which enrich in our lives. And that finally, someone of you, one of the tasks is to be that person at the table and argue for why quality is actually critical. Well, I've got one thing to say about the Miami airport too, by the way. <laughs> Is that the, that was a really instructive thing. I mean, God knows it was a disaster, but but the one thing that was missing out of those people was that they wouldn't let us have control of anything. And and when one thing I realized that like early on, and that maybe was like sort of something really pivotal, is that if you you can't control it, you can't make art out of it. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, and it doesn't matter how much good intentions you have, and it doesn't matter what, uh, whatever is that. It has to be one artist's personal vision. And they have to realize it with a certain amount of integrity and quality control, and not water it down too much, and not have too many air vents in the middle of it, and not, you know, not have like too many things that are completely things that go awry that you have no control over because all that stuff, all that stuff that intrudes on it and waters it down kills the art quality of it. And maybe that's why the Stuart Collection is so special, is because we did the pieces and they weren't watered down. And the Stuart Collection provided the backup to kind of control all the intrusive factors or minimize them or integrate them or do something to them so that there still was art quality. And when you do stuff out in the world, so much weird stuff happens to everything that it's a constant fight to keep the original idea going and not kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. So. so it's quality if Mary Beebe is job one, undiluted right. Beebe. Right. <laughs> The second session will be led by John Walsh, who was director of the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles from 1983 until last year. He is currently director emeritus of the Getty and always the scholar. He is also working on several writing projects as well as cavorting about having fun as a free agent. <laughs> John is such a hero to so many of us in the art world that he deserves something akin to sainthood, but sainthood with scholarship and mischief. Thank you, John, for being here. Your willingness to be here is, today is a true honor. Mary asked me for a title some weeks ago for this panel, um, and I proposed, how was it for you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and then she dropped the idea of titles for the panels completely. <laughs> It, it, it's, my role is going to be pretty simple. I'm going to ask you all some questions about your commissions and stuff, but um, I've got to say a couple things first. I mean, 
uh, really quite heartfelt things on my own part, because um, I, I look at everything in terms of museums, I'm sorry to say, including works of art in public places. Um, and contemporary artists I've seen, of course, show regularly uh, in museums. They have their work bought, and they have it shuffled around a great deal. Rarely does it say, stay in one place. Uh, it goes on the gal up in the gallery walls right away when it's acquired, or, uh, and then it goes to storage, usually, with some stops and loan exhibition. Anyway, it's really well out of their hands. In fact, it's well, uh, it's unstable and unfixed. Um, it, it, it honors the, the uh, Buddhist rule of impermanence in the world, uh, which, which in some of it's made for that and, and does well in, under those circumstances. What it lacks, though, is something that museums have been able to do for older art. You buy a Rembrandt, and by God, it stays in the same place. Uh, for years on end as an audience grows to maturity and makes, a, makes something of that work uh, as they uh, live their lives and people come to it from all over the place. Um, I'm not going to argue against impermanence. I am going to say though that this Stewart collection does something to exploit and show for all of us uh, the power to, of certain contemporary artists to make works of art that deserve a permanent place, and that expose it to that constant flux of people and ideas around. Uh, none of the pieces, including the most recent Elizabeths, um, are what they were when they went up. Neither, neither are we, neither is she, and she may talk about that, I don't know. Um, it, it, is, um, it is something that you have done for contemporary art and artists, and not to mention for this amazing, constantly changing audience that is you know, a new wave of kids every year, a changing faculty, and a whole audience that's, whose views change all the time as these pieces stay the same, uh, except for an occasional wash off now and again. Um, I um, wanted to say too that the, the artists here who've worked, in, and were artists who work in, in this vein in public places, um, do some of their work in, in a way akin to architects' work in the sense that they, they've got limits. Um, you all have had fewer than most, um, but there are clients with their own peculiarities, and in this case, a rather rich and complex client situation with a lot of interests that need to be mediated, and mostly Mary is out there butting heads uh, or cajoling uh, for you. But nevertheless, these are realities to a greater or lesser extent for all of you. You have specifications, you have even budget limits. Um, architects like to brag that these limits only add strength, that the project improves with every new setback, uh, up to the point where they walk off the job. Uh, it may be true for some of you that there were limits here and setbacks, and I'd be curious to know how they figure uh, in the way you now see these works of art. So um, I'm going to turn to, uh, uh, to uh, Terry first. You were the first. Um, uh, in 1986, um, Mary asked you to do outdoor sculpture, and you issued your edict that that was for the birds. Well, I have, there's, there's a, a more complex system of bird now you know, for me. Um, I was very resistant when I was initially asked to do it, um, probably because of my own prejudices and just the fact that I'd never experienced making anything outdoors and most of the stuff that I was familiar with, which wasn't really much, uh, I didn't like. Um, and it was, in a way, kind of turning tables on, on my own prejudices and say, oh, face your own music now, you know? And so I kept coming back here over and over, and it, it would have never happened if it hadn't been for Mary's persistence. And well, just come back one more time, you know? And uh, I kept going back to the groves. Uh, Every trip, I would go around, whatever. But also, you, one of the things you did confront that was kind of an adversary was the master plan, you know? Uh, every place that you went, potentially, within 30 to 50 years, there was going to be another building there. And so you got the feeling that the groves really were, you know, 
not high up on the master plan, and not to mention probably sculpture uh, at that time. But um, uh, I wanted to do something in those groves and those trees. I think like a lot of the artists have addressed here, there's something so incredibly unique about going the idea of going from one class to another, like a walk in the woods, even though I think I mentioned earlier that uh, or, or somewhere that uh, there's really no woods because this, there's really no nature because this is really Southern California, you know, so that, <laughs> that prospect doesn't really exist. Uh, but kind of on a fluke, um, I did a bunch of drawings. I was getting ready to go to Asia to, to work on uh, music for a film. And uh, Mary was started to put the heat on me a little bit to, to come up with an idea. And so I sent her several ideas. And uh, the one that seemed the most feasible was uh, the idea of going out into the groves and finding a dead tree and putting a, sound, a speaker in it and covering it with sheet lead. Um, that was my idea. It turns out, obviously, that uh, I hadn't included any thoughts of the code of the architectural codes, the earthquake codes, the codes of America, the codes of, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and one of the great things I think about working with in this situation was that Mary dealt with the codes, Matthew dealt with the codes. At every kind of angle, they were the person that was in between you and the bastards, you know. <laughs> and so consequently, you were, it was a real spoiler, uh, especially, I have gone on to do a number of public pieces, but never with the kind of freedom that I felt in this kind of, that the Sturt collection has, uh, provided. Bruce, your piece was uh, proposed in 1983, right at the very beginning of the project, but took five years to get done and open. Um, and in the meantime, the, the location of the piece tra changed r rather dramatically from, uh, from a theater all the way across the campus to a physics lab, with a lot of uh, interesting stuff in between. <laughs> I don't know how close you were to that or how much Mary told you at the time, but um, you were to have incited infidelity. Uh, and one professor uh, said, I think this is true. I hope it doesn't matter if it's true or not. One <laughs> member of the f faculty said that it would be then the, the university's obligation to explain to the community the differences between the virtues and vices. <laughs> were, were, were they to put them on display in public in that way? Only, you could, uh, 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 only a, f a faculty member could th think in that way about <laughs> social obligation. Um, so it, it changed in a big way. Um, how, does it, how does it look to you now? I mean, I'm asking this in both ways. Was that a, was that a, a healthy and good and a change? And secondly, coming back to it now after all this time, what do you think? I think it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad we got it on that building. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd not done very much commission work before, and my experiences weren't very good. One of the problems was always um, nobody kind of, you did a bunch of work and finally nothing happened and you never got paid. And so uh, I, at one point I called Klaus Oldenburg and asked him how did he set up contracts and things so that he got, didn't get uh, go broke, and uh, so he told me how he did it, and, and uh, you know you get paid at every step, and every, anybody can quit at any time, but it's all written down, and so everything's clear. And then he said the other thing you have to remember is that no matter what they tell you, they really want a medium-sized Henry Moore on a pedestal. <laughs> So, if you if you keep that in mind, you you won't you won't feel too bad when nothing works. Yeah. But then to come here where everything was so clear, um, you get paid this much and we just do everything else, and uh, it it's such a burden is removed. It started out as it was going to proclaim the vices and virtues 
on a high point in the campus. It was going to be like a lighthouse or, yeah, the, it was or a TV the tower. Building. And it was going to uh, um, name the vices and virtues on a theater, uh, evoking, I suppose, the elements of theatrical conflict. And, you know, it, it had a certain real, it had quite a lot of poetry and, and specific application to that place. So at first it must have seemed pretty wrenching to be kicked off that spot, huh? It was a little disconcerting because then I wasn't sure if it would lose its, its context you know, off, of, off of the theater. And, uh, and I decided it didn't matter and we should do it. So, um, but I did have to think about it. A it bit. got a new context, huh? I yeah, mean, yeah a, a much broader context. Michael, if I could turn to you. Um, when this started for you, you were talked to in 84. You were well known in Europe and New York and probably a few other places, but you hadn't had a piece permanently installed anywhere in the United States, as far as I know. Um, and it's, it's nice to think that your first piece for the United States played on this idea of permanence, huh? Um, being granite, being a monument as a kind of pendant to a stone monument on another place opposite the flag, right smack in the middle of the campus. Um, all of that had great uh, power and still does, but everything's been changing <laughs> since then, including our idea about what's permanent and what's not uh, in the built world. I'm curious to know what it's like to come back to this campus and wander around there, and what, what, do, you, what do you feel now? Well, the first thing, of course, uh, specifically, is that I chose the parkway with the hope that um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shift or it wouldn't change too much. And uh, a little bit what uh, Terry was saying, like, like the trees, maybe they wouldn't mess with them at all. When I first did it, um, I was so unsure of it. And then I told Mary, and Mary, Mary was enthusiastic and so enthusiastic, she just wanted to get it done. And I, I couldn't understand it. Usually I can explain a work uh, and go into uh, details because I have it pretty well organized in my mind. But this one, I, I, I couldn't at that time. The idea of permanency really bothers me a lot. The reason that I stayed away from permanency is, all, all, first of all, all my installations are deinstalled and they can't be reconstructed again. It's not as if they can be moved around or something like that. This one, um, for sure, I have to, I realize I had to address that problem. And it's a very difficult problem for me to address. And that's one reason I did the work that I did here. Hopefully, it would always be uh, addressing the meaning of uh, the questions I have of the history of outdoor sculpture. It'd be hard to find another piece or, or anywhere, I think, that concentrates so densely, so, so many ideas and associations, uh, historical, con contextual in every way. Huh? And it's, it also helps that it's a dense piece. Huh? I mean, it's, it's, a <laughs> it's, it's all squashed into this little familiar but unfamiliar box that happens to sit in a site that connects it in all sorts of ways to what's built already and to the life of the school and to water and st student life. and you know, the kind of generosity of providing water free to people. I mean, it's just, anyway, it's a gamut of ideas. And um, e knowing a little about how your mind works, um, I should have thought you would have had lots of misgivings from the beginning. It doesn't surprise me that you would have worried a lot after you built it. Oh. And you'd have worried a lot about people thought it, thinking it was a success. And before also. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I spent forever looking for a place and yeah. uh, thinking that uh, I could go some way, someplace far away where people wouldn't <laughs> traverse it and things like that. <laughs> then I realized, <laughs> then I realized I really wanted to confront the problem. I had to confront the problem, uh, like I say, not only of sculpture, but of the public using uh, the, the object. Uh, Elizabeth, you um, did something really new for you. Um, this little bit of 3D fairy tale in the, in the woods, um, a sort of hefty, hefty painting, um, uh, mysteriously dropped down where paintings don't normally 
or not even where sculpture no, isn't normally found. Um, d what is, took a little persuading on your part, but not so much, I guess, as you tell the story. You thought, why not? Sounds good, and you did it. Not much agonizing. I was sort of in a place in my life, really, where I felt like I wanted to be. I was just feeling like I wanted to be open to any kind of proposals, which is, I mean, it's something, you know, you don't necessarily ever imagine yourself in being in that place, really. But through um, Margaret Porter, I guess I was having a show with Margaret, and Mary um, told Margaret that she'd be interested in that. And then Mary called me, and I just thought, why not? And I was out here, and um, it wasn't until I got out here and I started walking around the campus, like, first of all, I feel basically about public art exactly the way Terry feels. I mean, I really don't like most of it at all. It's just like, why is this stuff here getting in my way, you know, like inserting itself into my head when you're walking around, and especially when you're outdoors. I mean, who wants to be in nature? And I think it's really kind of, I like Southern California. <laughs> I feel like there's nature here. Um, but just, you don't want to run into anything. You want to be in your own thoughts, in your own place. And so then I got here, and I, and I felt really scared. I thought, you know, I'm really not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. It's just, I can't make a sculpture. But I started to look at the stuff. Like, the first thing I saw was Bruce's piece up there. And, and even if it was daylight, too, and it still looked fantastic to me, like just these words that were going around the top of a building. It was so ludicrous in a way. Then I went to, <laughs> then I saw Terry's piece, which I just, it, as you go through and look at the stuff here, it's an amazing experience. And then uh, Bob's piece which I practically walked through before I realized where, <laughs> what I was doing. And um, Nam June Pike's piece, like it just was one thing after another. Michael's The Fountain, just, you know, like, then the fi finishing thing for me was walking up Alexis's snake path, which I just, and I just, with every piece, I thought, God, that's a great idea. Like, I wish I could just do this, you know, like, <laughs> rip up Alexis' snake path, and, which he allowed me to do that and put my own back in. But it was, it just felt like, and I knew most of the people, most of the artists pretty well. So, so there was something so unthreatening and fascinating about the situation, because it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like this sculpture sitting around. It feels like everything is blended, Everything's kind of a little cantankerous and renegade, but really not these objects that are, they're all, they all, it's almost seamless. It's really incredible the way it's woven into the campus. And I agree, I mean, the architecture is very bland, yeah. banal. If, you know, it just kind of, it, maybe that's a good part of it. It's really sort of ugly, but it doesn't get in your face and you can do anything around it. Um, but one of the, so, Kind of like Terry, I wanted, I kept walking around in the woods with Matthew and trying to find a place, and I think this was my insecurity, I wanted to get it as concealed as possible in case it was really bad. <laughs> and, uh, but I, and I began to get this idea of doing this, I had several ideas, but I, by the second time I came to look around, I had this idea of doing this shoe, like a stepping shoe, and which was an image I was working with. And, but I did want to find a place where it would be kind of covered up. And it seemed natural that it would be out in the eucalyptus grove someplace. So I kept walking further and further back and found the, the edge, which I wasn't aware of at all, that it was like right at the edge of the campus so that you could see a little bit of it as you approach from the outside. Um, I, I didn't realize that was going to happen until it was actually up there and we were driving in and, and Mary said, oh, look, there it is. Like, so, and I felt like, oh, God, you know, like I, I did assert myself into the world in a way I really <laughs> hadn't intended to. But the other thing I want to say is, and that's sort of, you know, I don't really think, I mean, never say never, but I didn't really, I still don't feel totally comfortable with the piece. 
I still feel ambivalent about it. And the thing that happened for me, like just, is I realized I'm not a sculptor, that I don't really enjoy it in a kind of way, the way I enjoy like making the illusions of painting. So that was like, and I don't mean to like dismiss the piece because on the other hand, it's, I love having it here. It is just fabulous to have that piece here. To, and a lot of it is about community for me. Like being with artists who are really, really good artists and be and knowing that and how Mary has put this together just feels like I it's like if I'm going to do a sculpture to have the one sculpture I'll probably do here feels really great I, I had a feeling if, if you play this tape 50 years from now uh, my little sermon on permanence and the various references to it will seem very funny to people God knows what this campus will be like there won't be anybody to defend the particular placement and the particular relationship of the pieces. What happens, um, Terry, if um, that grove gives way to a building? Um, those trees transplant? You for, should forgive the expression. I've already experienced that to a degree with one of the trees, the one that's in front of the library. You, you all know uh, that the, the tree that's now in front of the library was in front of the library, but a lot happened to the yeah, library in the it meantime. It was initially on the, kind of on the side yeah. of the library. and. Uh, then they did a whole kind of massive construction and uh, basically put the tree uh, in storage. And uh, uh, then there, there was an issue of like where it was going to be put back up. And uh, I don't know, but I had the sneaking suspicion that it was going to be put back up far, far away, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Mary and I talked about it and, and uh, um, I decided that it should go right in front of this library, um, the, I, the one that looks like the spaceship to me. Um, and initially, I learned too that some, sometimes it's better to come out with the most outrageous plan for something in order to get your second idea across. <laughs> Uh, so my initial proposal was to do like a huge chain and attach the tree to it somewhat like a disco medallion and hang it from the, from the library. <laughs> and they immediately liked the idea of the tree being in front of the library, you know. <laughs> So it, it was actually installed there, and um, I believe there was a two-year probation uh, that if people hated it so much that they could, they had the right to take it. But I don't, I, to my knowledge, uh, there hasn't been any problem since it's been there. And it's kind of the table of contents for, for my piece because the two other trees, one of them is music, uh, plays music, the other one tells stories. And everybody that's kind of been involved with the trees, their names are nailed on uh, in, into the lead on that tree in front of the library. So it's, I was going to have it go shh. <laughs> but fortunately I didn't do that. <laughs> well, I, su I suppose when the library annex is built right where the trees are now, you could imagine a time when they might be moved to another piece of grove somewhere else? Is that thinkable? Well, I thought, you know, that, you know, it, my trees might be the last trees in the, on the, you know, campus. <laughs> <laughs> or the next to go. <laughs> you know? After they're all cut down, the, the lead trees will stand. Yeah, Ma Matthew, when we were first installed, Matthew would kind of roam around the area looking for axes, you know, in, t in case some student, disgruntled student might take one of them down. Bruce, the, the, uh, what goes on in engineering changes so fast. I, I mean, this is up-to-date structures, testing, building. You all know that the vices and virtues march around the top part, the freeze, you could say, of a building in which attempts are made on the life of uh, footings for bridges and stuff. Uh, they try to tr 
test the durability of materials and structures. Um, but I suppose that that building will be redundant in a generation or so, and it'll, it'll be an extremely handsome sculpture base, that building. <laughs> but probably fairly expensive to dismantle, so you might be in luck that way. Yeah. Well, what happens? Could you imagine the vices and virtues having made the trip already in your mind from the theater to the physics building? Could it go somewhere else? I suppose, but, you know, we, before it got to that building, uh, we looked at a lot of, all over the campus for different opportunities, and nothing really seemed to work. So I, it, uh, it would change it a lot to move it. Plus you scaled it exactly to yeah, that freeze yeah. and that height, huh? Right. And I can't imagine it without that transparency now, which it wouldn't have had in the first No, the, the window behind, so yeah. you can see it inside. It's so much a part of how the piece works yeah. now. Well, I think the whole thing of permanence is just so fascinating right now, because obviously not very much really is. And even in museums, like it's, you know, maybe just because of, of September 11th and the attack and the enormity of what was destroyed. It's like that's the, a tragic part of it. And then I, I think that there is also a, a silly part of the idea of permanence. It's like our denial. And um, I could see, yeah, like I, I think the one thing that would be not great would be if somebody wanted to preserve it and they put it inside someplace. I mean, that's the, because that's not at all the way it was intended, but um, I don't think we have much control over it, really. I think it's a good idea to just give up that idea that it's going to stay there forever and you're going to fight to the death for it to have this thing. Because I really don't, I don't feel that way um, I'm about it. I think it's just not really in the end very feasible so to like give with uh, stuff and to be open like Terry was talking about or like John's changes that that ideas of what could happen and what couldn't happen to really be flexible because you, you have to be anyway. So Michael you may be the last to get bulldozed because that's kind of a shrine that little mall isn't it? It's got the American flag in the middle and it's got the monument to the original camp that was here and then there's your water fountain it's kind of anchored in there but what if the Chancellor wants to put that water fountain in a better place like next to his office? <laughs> it would be something totally different and not yeah. uh, and it wouldn't have anything to do with my intention because the uh, the drinking fountain is absolutely contingent on the pathway, the flag, the, and the uh, rock uh, behind it, and all of those things working together. And the reciprocity or the, or the viewer's ability, it's also contingent on the, the viewer using it to uh, view the similarities and dissimilarities between, let's say, just begin with the, the rock and the, and the fountain. Um, all those would be lost. Everything like that would be lost, and and it wouldn't, it would no longer be like a critical tool to begin to investigate out, outdoor sculpture. Uh, it would become uh, an autonomous object in, in and of itself, which is precisely what I didn't want it to do. I mean, one thing that's going to keep your ideas alive, and therefore give your pieces a chance, a greater chance than is usual, to maintain their context, is the fact that. You've said what you've said, that it's published, that there's, it's, these works are open to constant discussion. There's going to be a long, 50 years from now, a long record of debate about these pieces. It's going to be a whole lot harder for someone uh, to take some drastically different approach to those works um, in a way that is so often done with art in public uh, and even in museums, I have to say. Well, I think permanence, too, has to do with your time, the way you think about your own time. I know I was very briefly involved in the Miami airport uh, project. That <laughs> but fairly quickly you realize this was going to be a life work, you know, and I did not want to spend my life at the Miami airport, you know. <laughs> um, but I do think, that, you know, I feel exactly like Elizabeth as far as I've never had that much of an interest in really in work that you've that's over your interest your focus your energy is nearly always going toward the thing that you're making at the time that you're working toward at the time and uh, 
this is great to come back because it is such a wonderful uh, circumstance of, I think, most of the artists' lives, you know, of, of being able to work in this situation and the things you've gleaned from it and whatever. Um, it was a first chance for me to have a platform where I could ask other people to be participants in it, uh, invite them to send me tapes to do things. And as far as a permanent kind of thing, uh, Mary and I have talked about maybe getting the music department and the theater or, or the uh, English department to do a contest each year and we'd sit and, and, and pick up a tape, somebody reading a poem or somebody uh, doing a composition that they're, and put them on the tree. So you build up a collection of students, a uh, collection over a period of time. But, but I think permanence is, you know, we're not permanent, so. You all think about the artists, the younger artists you know, let's just say, I don't know, under 40, let's say, um, that you really admire, that people who you think are sure to be the next, well, the next you, uh, <laughs> if, if should have, who, the people whose work you, and minds you think tremendously promising, are, are they going to be likely to want to do work for the Stewart Collection? Are they going to want to, put work in public places under the circumstances that, that are, uh, of this place and how do you, are, do, are, is this, is the Stewart collection the work of a generation um, and have things shifted out from under us and are they very Mary different? I would let that happen. Like I, and I also well, think that just, Mary would. Let's take Mary out of the picture here, if I may, Mary. Find somebody who would do it. But she Mary's, could talk anybody into Mary's it. Mary's replacement, let's say. <laughs> Is she going to be able to find artists um, who w want to, and are willing to, and who are able to work under the circumstances well, that you Well, they're cloning now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, what you were saying, I'm sorry. Well, I think, first of all, I don't think a lot of people know about it. Um, but I f think any younger artist who came here and walked around, because I, I do think it's a little generational, definitely, and that, that, that there's, but, and there's definitely room for some, some different, some other ideas here, and it would be great to have a younger generation, a few people, come um, try their hand at it. But I, I would be persuaded taking Mary out of it, that, that it, when they saw what it was, that they would have the same experience that I would have. People aren't that different, whether they're 60 or 30. In terms of thinking, God, I just would love to see if I could do something in this context. Because it's not like, I know what I'm trying to, it's not like an art thing. That's what I liked the best of it. It just didn't feel like threatening everybody's big egos getting in there and seeing what they could do to like. It just doesn't have that feeling. And I think there are younger artists that would really love to, to work in it, in that feeling. This is only a little bit about um public outdoor sculpture, this collection. Um, it's prim for me, primarily, it's about uh, the ideas, moving ideas uh, around uh, and trying to evaluate them and see their, their merit and uh, how they could be used in the future and things like that. So whether you do it with a videotape or you do it with a painting or you do it with um, outdoor sculpture, it's, it's what the situation allows you to do, but each one you'll be addressing these que certain questions which uh, you find challenging. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if that's the nature of the invitation, to come and investigate the possibilities for you here, not look for a site to put something mm -hmm. down, that's different, isn't it? And it might have a, it might, it might reach, that proposition might reach people who wouldn't respond, would, resp or would think outdoor arts for the birds, you know? Well, the thing, it's, it's open to curiosity, and as long as there's curious people who make things, people that are curious about a circumstance, and I don't see what age is going to have to do with it, really, you know? Th thank you all very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Bruce.